Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anthony Mills. I'm the Executive Director of Global Innovation Institute. As most of you know, Global Innovation Institute is the world's leading professional certification, business accreditation, and membership association in the world of innovation. Once a month, we host uh, monthly webinars, such as the one today, in order to expand on our body of knowledge and our understanding and our community's understanding of what goes into driving innovation regionally, inside of uh, nations, inside of regions, as well as inside of organizations. And so we want to welcome you to our September 2023 webinar today. Uh, uh, today is September 12th, 2023. Let me uh, introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Dr. Ludovic Garzik. Ludovic is the managing director of the Austrian Council for Research, Science, Innovation, and Technology Development, a post he's held since 2005. This council is a strategic recommending body to the Austrian government. Since 2015, he has also served as the Managing Director of Innovation Orbit, a business school for innovation ecosystems and cultures. Ludovic holds a master's degree in geodesy from the Technical University of Vienna, and a doctorate in marketing from the Vienna University of Economics and Business Administration. In addition, he has also received an MBA from Danube University Krems and is a state certified economic technician. Prior to his current roles, Ludovic was in the space business, serving as a delegate to the European Space Agency and the European Commission, where as his main area of focus, he worked as a director on the implementation of the Galileo Satellite Navigation Program. Ludovic is also a guest professor at Shanghai University and the Shanghai Institute for Science and Technology Management, as well as a member of the LIMAC Austrian Business School faculty. Last year, Ludovic and his colleagues published the book Successful Innovation Systems, which aims to increase readers' understanding of how innovation processes are either accelerated or hindered by different regional characteristics. The book examines the characteristics of innovation ecosystems and via a SWOT analysis analyzes 12 regions around the globe, covering such cities as New York, Silicon Valley, Medellin, Berlin, Zurich, Moscow, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Bangalore, Sofia, Nairobi, and others. Today, Ludovic is going to be talking to us about precisely that subject. And in particular, what we can all learn and take away about these innovation processes so that we too can accelerate and not hinder innovation processes in our region of the world. This is a very important topic for all, all of us who wish to make our region of the world that much more innovative and globally competitive. So please join me now, if you will, in welcoming Dr. Ludovic Garzik to our webinar today. Ludovic, the, the floor is all yours. Anthony, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good lunchtime, uh, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be a guest of the, the Institute today. Uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, social uh, uh, innovation. Let's talk about uh, global ecosystems. Let's talk about uh, innovation in these ecosystems. So our topic today is more or less uh, how people are doing innovation in different uh, regions of the world. So people are socialized in specific environments uh, due to their attitudes, uh, to their surroundings. And we want to know today uh, how knowledge is implemented in these ecosystems uh, due to these uh, cultural surroundings. So let me just uh, share my screen uh, for a little bit of background. I give you a little bit of introduction and then we can go into uh, discussion as well. So, uh, Anthony uh, already mentioned uh, there are two roles I have. Uh, it's the one as a CEO for the Austrian Council, and the other one that I started uh, a little bit uh, uh, later in 2015 is uh, Innovation Orbit. And why did I do that? So, this is more or less the topic of today uh, because I was looking for intercultural education at that time. Uh, that would bring me to a better understanding of the differences of the attitudes of people around the world in ecosystems and which tools they use to do innovation. Uh, as I didn't find the adequate education uh, for that, like postgraduate education, 
I thought, okay, let's let's start it by myself. Maybe there's there's some people who want to do that as well. And uh, th that is the, the background of uh, why innovation came into place. So people want to prepare for future. How do they do that? They do analysis and then they do strategy. So more or less they make a picture, a mosaic of, of the future about where they want to go. And then uh, they should implement the strategy and what happens? They do the analysis, the strategy, and then there is no implementation. That was more or less the, the, the background of uh, having the idea of why is it very useful uh, to learn about different cultures. Because normally, if you're socialized in a certain ecosystem, like you know, in Europe, in the US, in China, you think that this world is, is complete. And uh, why should you do more? But the people who do the same strategy that they did before, why should they do a different implementation? They still have the same tools and the same culture. So there's a, a missing link between these. And uh, like uh, one of them was Peter Drucker who told us, culture is strategy for breakfast, uh, which means why should th these people change uh, suddenly and do a, a different strategy implementation than they did before? Because ecosystem, and this is one of the basements of our discussion today, act on the common beliefs. And uh, remember, it's beliefs, it's not knowledge. But, but what is the difference? Uh, let me just have one, one thought on that. You have beliefs and you have the truth. You can also say it's kind of uh, the reality. So all the things we believe from reality, it can be called our knowledge. Which on the other hand uh, means if we are able to expand our beliefs, to so expand our cultural understanding, different tools, also the knowledge will be bigger because we can accept more of reality. And if you think of the, the last years, uh, like the pandemic, you can easily uh, think of things that people put into their belief session, and that's not part of reality. I think you know what I'm speaking of. But now for knowledge implementation, it's very important that the beliefs join your knowledge. So we have analysis like before, but now we are doing a missing link in there. We put the cultural experience to develop tools of different ecosystems, of other ecosystems that you are uh, used to. And after we have done that, we do the strategy like we did before, but now as we have new tools and a new cultural environment, we are also able to do the implementation in a different way and in a proper way. So these are my colleagues. These are my colleagues who I wrote the book with. Yeah, maybe you have seen this uh, somewhere in the, let me see, like this. Yeah, you can read it. That's how it looks like. Uh, it's the, the 12 ecosystems Anthony spoke of. Um, as the pandemic came in, we, we couldn't travel. And it's um, normally it's easier to learn from the cultural experience if you're in the region where it happens. As we couldn't travel, uh, we discussed how, what can we do. And uh, so we decided to, to write all the experiences down uh, in, in the book. We published it. And now it's more or less as we can travel again. It's a teaser. Uh, for the new um, implementation of, of innovation trainings. Uh, I will uh, remind you later, it will be an innovation training in Bangalore this year in, in November. So it's uh, very easy to understand now what the difference is in, in culture because you have the 12 chapters in the book and you can compare about also what your interests could be uh, because there is a SWOT analysis of all the resources uh, in an ecosystem and then you can compare all the different, the 12 ecosystems uh, we have in the book. Why do we do that? Because normally we ask the questions, what and how? This is the technical issue. And I, I'm a technician as well. Uh, I studied at a technical university here in Vienna. Uh, but there is a, a third question that is even much more important when you do innovation. Uh, because what and how is it more than knowledge side, but what's the innovation side? It's emotion, it's the why. I give you an example of what I mean. HTC, some of you maybe remember 
this is or was a, a brand of mobile phones in the in the last 15 years and it started quite uh, at the same time uh, than another one like apple and HTC focused on technology. They, they were very good in technology. They always had the, the best features, the new features, the best camera, uh, the most precise one. Apple had a very good technical background as well, but they focused as well on customer experience. So they focused on the emotions of their potential customers. And what happened after 10 years of operation, HTC had about 24 million phones sold per year. And Apple had about 10 times so much. So this is the, the tricky difference between the questions how and what and why that obviously Apple answered much better than its competitors. So beliefs, where do they come from? Uh, they come from our surroundings. They come from fam family and friends, of course, when we are raised, uh, when we take up uh, the attitudes of our surroundings, of our environment. And there is a level of mindfulness and tolerance. Uh, I come back to that a little bit later as well, because tolerance is one of the most important resources in an ecosystem. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I can also give you some other hints about uh, Stoicism about a high programs uh, that run in, in all of us and that more or less shape the, the culture and uh, how we do innovation and knowledge implementation. And there is also interfaces to external cultural sources, because if you want to expand your culture, you have to get examples, you have to look there, you have to learn it, you have to have, uh, as we, we discussed before, the light bulb in your head coming up when you understand different cultures and, and tools. And if you close down your culture, it never happens for a good end. So when we see uh, like regions, like nations closing up and not opening to external sources, the next years they will not develop like others. Clayton Christensen also told us about that when he said that the company's executives have to take into account that implementation of their uh, ideas is in the same hands of the people that developed the strategy before. And they're forged in the company's mainstream value network. And that's the same for regions. So you have a regional value network, you have a socialization. What are the resources I, I, I speak of in innovation ecosystems? So there's a bunch of them. There's finance, there's HR, like people, knowledge, skills. There's institutional settings, there is uh, universities, RTOs, there are agencies in between. There's also a legal framework like regulation. There's a very important, uh, the mindset, uh, this, the beliefs I uh, spoken of, tolerance. PIF, uh, I, I have to explain that, that's paid forward. Uh, that comes more or less uh, from Silicon Valley, where you put into the system without uh, earning back at the moment, but earning back from the system. You have also policies uh, that come from government, from strategy, and you have service providers. Uh, they play a very important role as well in risk management. So if you have them on board for your projects, for your startups, for your expanding VC uh, development, like uh, tax law, accountants, uh, management consultants as well, if they are part of the risk project, normally you develop much faster. So you have all these resources now. And uh, what we did in the book is more or less, we took a list of them, a list of the resources. And uh, you see two parameters here. It's flexibility and it's importance. Let me explain that. Uh, flexibility is how fast can you change one of the resources? Which means uh, in pandemic, we have seen that money was available at a very short moment. So hundreds of millions of dollars and euros uh, came down the pot uh, to, to finance whatever the pandemic uh, risks were. Uh, even in an ecosystem of innovation, uh, money is not discussed resource normally. It's more the, the ideas. So the flexibility is how fast can you change this resource? So I would say like money is much more flexible than culture and mindset. Culture and mindset, it's more a matter of generations to change. And the other indicator is importance. 
importance means how important is that resource for the functioning of the ecosystem. So importance is when you put out this resource, then you just take it out of the ecosystem. What happens? Is uh, anybody noticing or is the ecosystem not functioning anymore? So this is uh, the distinction between one and 10 in importance. And then we, we just put some numbers in. So one is not flexible, 10 is very flexible. One is not important, 10 is very important. And uh, I think everybody will find his own innovation ecosystem indicators like this list. This is an example we found for our ecosystem. And what we can do right now is we can do a scatter plot of these two parameters. We can have flexibility on one axis and uh, importance on the other axis. And uh, what happens is that we have a point that I called the point of origin. It's 10, 10. So it's very flexible and very important which means the impact there is fast and big. So if you start there, uh, uh, let me have an analogy. Uh, put a drop in a water at the point of origin. And as the circles expand, they take these resources. And the first they take, you more or less put a lot of energy in. So the, the most energy you put in the, the uh, the, the points that are near the point of origin, like risk capital, migration, and digital infrastructure, and all these things. Which means that uh, resources that are further from this point of origin, they, they get very low energy uh, from transformation. In, in the book, there is also a little bit more detail about that, uh, also how to distribute the energy. It's, the, it's called the double energy principle, so that every resource that is further away gets just half the energy than the one before. Now come back to the customers, they act on their emotions. So let's start with a little bit of distinction between uh, the global regions. So I don't do it uh, special regions on a national level, but more on a, on a uh, broader level. There is, uh, some of you may remember, remember, there was a triple helix analysis that was uh, um, invented by Henry Etzkowitz in the, in the end of the 90s. Uh, there was also a quadruple helix then, but uh, keep to the easy, simple model of knowledge, innovation, and consensus. Knowledge, innovation, we already had. So knowledge is gain new knowledge. Innovation is implement knowledge into the market. And the consensus is all the things that keep them together, like regulation, legal infrastructure, and all the stuff. And then have some examples. So we, we have a lot of knowledge and not too much innovation and a quite good developed consensus. Let's have a thought on that, what region in the world that could be. I would suggest, and we can discuss this uh, later on, of, of course, I suggest this would be Europe. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of knowledge. And uh, we don't take all out innovation. Maybe sometimes the others do. Second example would be a little bit less knowledge and lots of innovation. So more or less get more innovation out of the knowledge that you have yourself and also take from others. That could be Silicon Valley or East Coast as well. And the third one would be fair, fair knowledge and uh, quite good innovation. Maybe the consensus uh, still not that developed, but that uh, obviously doesn't hinder innovation. That could be Asia, that could be China, that could be South Korea or something like that. So that would be the, the difference in the global regions uh, for this kind of knowledge and innovation stuff. And how do we now find out how our own culture, how our own innovation ecosystem can work better? So we just learn from the others. Let's have a look at China. China is quite interesting because it developed very much in the last years. So it's, uh, if you want to say so, it's a, a latecomer in that. So the, the, the last 15 to 20 years were very decisive. Uh, when you see from 2000 to 2015, uh, all the research spending went up like hell. So that they passed by the, the average numbers of most of the other regions, and uh, not just for R&D spending, also the patent applications and implementations as well. And it happened that in some branches, in some industries, uh, this really changed the market completely. So China more or less took over uh, most of the market from the others, like here in fertilizers. 
there, there's these examples now in manufacturing, high speed rail, internet industry, but today as well, e mobility is dominated by China. So, five years ago, we had an innovation training in, in Shenzhen, and I took the group to BYD. And I can tell you, nobody of them, native from which region ever they were, they, they didn't know BYD at all. And I told them, as long as they are happy with the Chinese market, we will not see them. But now they are they filled up the Chinese market and they're coming to Europe. And uh, these days, newspapers are full of B by D, uh, how good the, the, the cars are. They're also a little bit cheaper. They have better batteries. Even B by D is more or less a, a battery company. And they build the car around the battery, which is much, much easier than the other way around. So they have a car and build, try to get in a battery uh, instead of a combustion uh, engine. So what are they doing we don't do? Why, why were they that successful? They just do. They, they, they don't discuss about it. They, they try to go to the market as soon as they have new knowledge. And why do they do that? So if you look at the university system and all the education system there, they have a very interesting combination. They do a lot of technology, basic technology, advanced technology, but they also do arts. They do fine arts and in the same studies, which means people learn about technology, but also about communication, which means if you learn them fine arts, uh, like painting, like uh, theater play, they learn how to communicate with an audience. And technology is not nothing else than looking for an audience to use it. And uh, this combination you have in many of the university programs there. Uh, Europe and the US is coming up a little bit like that, but uh, about 10 to 15 years later than they do. The second example would be Africa. Uh, th this is one of my favorite slides because it shows how, how large the thing is. Yeah, normally on the, uh, I come from geodesy. Uh, in the Mercator projections of our world, normally Africa is very small because of their uh, kind of pro projection you do in the, on the maps, but you can see it's more or less the rest of the world uh, getting into like uh, the US, China, India, Eastern Europe. It's all in there. It's UK, it's Japan. So it's a, a really big continent. And uh, what we sometimes don't realize is Africa is not a country. Africa is 54 countries. It's uh, more than a billion people. It's uh, thousands of languages and cultures. We know that many of them are not on a development level like the, the Western industry countries, but still there's a lot of potential. And why is there? Because they're young. They're much younger than all the other continents. You have uh, average ages uh, below 20 and just on that continent. You have no other continent, no other region in the world that is that young, which means in the next 100 years, they're, only, they're the only one growing. And we know about uh, the connection between, between uh, growing of population and productivity and the economic effects. So that's what we will see in the next decades and in the next century. And there, there is one saying of Eric Hirschman that's always interesting. We should, we should stop thinking about how Africa can be more like us. We should rather think about how we can be more like Africa. And why is that? The first thing is, like Bitang and Demo, who I uh, met in, in Nairobi, uh, told us it's first innovation, then regulation. So Europe and also the, the US, uh, we tend to regulate everything before the innovation baby is already born. Uh, it's much easier the other way around, uh, because then you can test it and uh, regulate afterwards. And the other thing is, disruptive innovations emerge at the bottom of the market. Why is that? Because there, the usefulness, the ease of use, it's much different from a satisfied market where all the technology is just a little add-on. So if you change a little bit of the energy or logistic system in these markets, people will come up if there is a usefulness. If they are safe just $1 on a, on a trip, I don't know, between Nairobi and, and, uh, and uh, Rwanda, then people will just merge to the other way of mode of transport. 
or the energy system. So people will change very fast if there is a little bit more usefulness. And then you see uh, how the innovation really works. And uh, that's also from, from uh, Christensen. You see that the, the first innovation effects, they happen in a zone that is not so interesting as a market because you don't earn the big money with that. But as soon as these innovations come to this green zone, where the performance is enough really to, you know, then it's too late to get in. So all the incumbents that are in the market, they will be surprised and they, they can't adapt so fast to, to, uh, to compete with the startups that are already in the market. So what, what is frugal innovation? Why, why do I mention that? Because that's Africa. Frugal innovation is all that happens on the technology level that people really use. We, we, we lost track a little bit of, of uh, in our countries of this kind of frugal innovations because we have so many features we never use that we don't see these features that are really useful for us. And it's not just functional, it's also affordable, but it's also sustainable. It's less complex, it's user-friendly. So if we see in our markets, the frugal effects of a new product, we will be the first in the market. We will earn more than the others. We will be really competitive. Some examples for that would be like uh, mobile phones, uh, transport, uh, water treatment, uh, but as well uh, logistic systems with uh, drone despots. It's much easier with less regulation in the air market uh, than we have in, in our regions. It's also money, mobile money. So if uh, banking people come to me to say, okay, what can we do in innovation? Then I, I just uh, get them a trip to Nairobi because they can see their future there. Uh, they, they have already leapfrogged us uh, in their system, uh, in, the, in the banking system, also in the, in the energy system. Now we come a little bit to the book and uh, to what I mentioned in the executive citations. So the evolution of the innovation ecosystem is driven by the precision innovation, which means it's an optimum distribution of change energy. So in every system, you have uh, a system that, like it happens to work, but you also have some transformational energy. And the interesting thing is how do you distribute? Where do you invest your transformational energy? And uh, if you add rebelling intellectuals, as I call them, so people who have ideas and want to implement them, and also tolerance, which means there are people adapting to new products and testing new products, you will be on your way to cooking a successful innovation meal, which means first you have to see where you are in your innovation ecosystem. Most people who tell me, oh, we are in a run phase, we have a very successful innovation ecosystem, they are, they are still in this news mode. They have no idea what really happens uh, when they wake up or warm up. So the wake up can happen when um, some smart people build a new company or say, okay, you have good resources, I come to your place and I do that. Which means to warm up, the ecosystem has to develop a magnetic effect to smart people. People who have an idea somewhere in the world, they, they uh, develop a list in their head about where can I implement my idea best. And if your region is not on the list and not in the top of this list, you are not in the warm up phase because no, nobody will go there and, and uh, do the innovation and uh, also bring other people and a bunch of uh, infrastructure and uh, money as well. And when you have that, when you're running, then you can uh, see, okay, there is no shortcut in the evolution, uh, which means if you're in this news mode, you need something to wake up and you need the warm up phase as well. There will be no uh, shortcut for that. Tolerance, as I mentioned before, is one of the most significant preconditions. And uh, it's, it's really important to say it's a precondition. You have to have it in your region to be able to have success in your innovation ecosystem. Is there a conservative uh, culture? You will never be able to do things like uh, build, measure, learn, uh, like uh, Eric Ries told us uh, in, in Lean Startup. So the minimum viable product, somebody has to test it, give you feedback. And th this must be some tolerance, some openness to new products, to new services, 
in your region. Otherwise, you will never get feedback and you can't develop more. The number of smart people in the world at a given moment in time is finite. So smart people are very mobile. They, they go there where they think their idea can be developed fast. And uh, if your region is not there, as I mentioned, there will be, it will be not easy to develop that. And the company is the enabling structure for the talent and a successful company never will uh, change the talent from the idea and the project, which means there is not an innovation department that develops ideas and there are others that implement. It's always the same people. They have to have the intrinsic motivation to develop their own ideas. And this is a kind of regulation stuff. Uh, the accountants normally try to kill the idea babies before they have to see in the light of the day. Because normally the incumbent system, the middle management of big companies, they are not interested into new products. They're interested in the money of the existing products. And they put all the energy in keeping these products. And uh, as we can see in history, there have been some very important uh, examples uh, like Nokia, like Kodak, where the middle management was not interested in new stuff. And uh, yeah, for young people, we have to explain who these companies were because they don't remember. They have never heard these names. I already mentioned that. And uh, the failures, the failure culture, we know that if you made the, the fifth failure, normally VCs will also ask why you did that and you won't get money anymore. But uh, failure is more or less the same uh, as an experience. And it's very good to collect these experiences for your ecosystem because it's a very good source of learning and new tools. Yeah, and uh, what happens in uh, modern Western industry countries is that in the slipstream of prosperity, there is the danger of complacency which means is the young generation still hungry to do new things, to take risks, to implement their ideas? Or is the money they get from their incumbent company, is it more or less a pride not to implement their ideas? So that's what we see also in capitals. Uh, that's why normally in capitals of, of uh, nations, there is no innovation center because uh, people are going to administration. They don't do innovation. They have very good jobs, very complacent jobs in administration. Uh, if you want to have examples, uh, it's Washington and Silicon Valley in the US, like Anthony. Uh, it's uh, maybe also New Delhi and Bangalore in India. It's uh, Beijing and Shenzhen in, in China. So there, there are a few examples of that. If you don't pay for a service, you are not the customer, you are the product. And think of that when you uh, take your free licenses of whatever product, of whatever app. Uh, always be aware you are now the product and uh, your, your data will be sold. And if you implement your idea, never forget, don't be too late. And if you are not embarrassed about the first version of your product, you will be maybe too late on the market because others will be earlier. The strongest position in a competitive environment will be with those organizations who have the ability to adapt fastest to change conditions. So uh, like we learned, it's not the, the big eating the small one, but it's the fast eating the slow one. And that's what we can see also in uh, our modern economies, which normally is not the nation, but more regional uh, system of uh, university education system combined with some companies and they're the successful in the ecosystems. And uh, as fast as they can change, the more successful they will be. Uh, all the citations are more or less from the middle of the book. So there is no executive summary. There's executive citations. So for you to remember, but it's not in the beginning. It's uh, in the middle between the first chapters about resources and the last chapters about the, the regions, about the 12 regions. So if you will learn more about these citations, uh, just consult that. I have uh, two or three more. Quality of an ecosystem is well defined. If you abandon resource castles in an uh, acceptable time frame, 
yeah, uh, because otherwise they will just uh, get your transformational energy and there will be no transforming of your ecosystem and there will be no development. The company is an enabling structure and if you have the ideas implemented, then the company will be successful. So this was the last citation. Uh, what I recommend you, all of you, is try to see the world with the eyes of the others. Also try to see it there where it happens. So more or less our webinar today is a first introduction. It's a teaser for getting into other cultures uh, more in depth, for getting to know the differences of your culture to other cultures and try to see it. So my recommendation is really to go there uh, and, and see it for yourself. Because why do we do that? We want to know what our cultural framework of innovation is. That's more or less the analysis before. What our patterns and processes are. So make you aware and do a fair analysis. So don't cheat yourself about where you are. And see if there is a digital mindset to imprint it within the organizations. So it's not just you in your position, in your role, but it's also kind of leadership and imprinting like, because if you are the, the, the head of your company, of your organization, of your agency, it's also the question if your leadership, if your new ideas, if your cultural innovation mindset can be implemented, uh, I always use the term imprint through the hierarchy down. So the, the last uh, of your employees also kind of uh, lifts the culture every day of this innovation mindset. What I can recommend you is uh, Bangalore. So we have also kind of a brochure. I put it in the chat afterwards. So uh, we are a small group. Uh, if you want to meet uh, me, myself, I will be there as well. It's uh, in the end of November. It's also convenient to go there because it's not too hot anymore there uh, at that time because it's south of India. As well, Bangalore is uh, elevated at 1,500 meters. Uh, so, which means uh, the, the climate there is, is quite good. It's also uh, Bangalore Tech Summit, if you uh, know that. It's also in the same week, so it's uh, good for a combination. Thanks for your attention. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you today, and uh, it will also be a pleasure to answer your questions now. Anthony, it's your time. How, how yes. We're doing great. They're doing great. So uh, thank you so much for that presentation, Ludovic. It's greatly appreciated. And so for all of us in the audience here, I would invite you to submit your questions in the chat window and uh, or if you'd prefer to uh, unmute yourself and uh, join in and ask your questions directly, that would be fine, too. But either way, give us give us your questions. Give us your questions for Ludovic and he'll try to address them. So while we're waiting on a couple from the audience there, let me just ask uh, a couple of things, uh, if I if, if I will. Um, so I really love the part you talked about the balance of energy uh, and precision innovation. To me, that struck a chord. That was like amazing, and I think I think that's such a key point. Like you've got all these different resources, and yeah, some are more important, and you've got that sweet spot. But ultimately. From my, what my experience is, you really need all of these ecosystem resources working together in harmony with each other to get that balance of energy to really get to the optimal state to where you're really running. Um, is, is that is that your experience? Uh, you can comment on that on that balance a little bit more about that balance. Yeah, I, I think there are two things. Uh, so the, the the first things is, um, are you aware of your transformational energy? I think that, that that's the first thing because people go to office every day and they, they do things. They they answer emails, uh, they do a word file, they do a new kind of strategy implement. But I don't think they're really aware of their transformational energy in their role, which means if you are a head of some department and oh no, no, you have 100 people, and how do you distribute this kind of energy in the resources on these 100 people? And what I suggest is to make this kind of scatter plot and say, okay, where can we start? Where is our good, uh, I don't know, importance? Uh, where is our flexibility? Where can we start? And when we know where to start, so which resource is really impactful, then put about 50% of your transformational energy there, which means 50 people just for one topic. 
nobody does that. You know, just if you put your awareness to this kind of distribution of energy stuff, then you will be also ready to imprint uh, for your people, for your colleagues, for your employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing that is connected to that is, um, so I, I come from a little bit of mathematics, you know, you have this kind of um, functioning of uh, the ecosystem where the resources function with processes. So this is working. And if you make the first derivation, it's uh, normally the, the velocity of uh, how the change happens. So the speed of change, if you like to say that. And if you put this once more, the next derivation is the acceleration. So how can you change the speed of your transformation? And if you're aware of that, then you can focus on the acceleration because the functioning normally it works like everyday business, mm -hmm. but the impact of the acceleration is that what you want and that what you really can uh, place an impact on the transformation of your system and an impact on your competitive advantage. That's fascinating. You know, another point you made that I found very fascinating was it's not just the presence of these resources or the quantity of, of them, but it's also the quality of them. And, and the, there's nuances. And specifically, when you're talking about China, you're talking about how they integrate art into the in, into the uh, education, not just technology, but it's the hybridization of technology and art and communication. So to me, there's this nuance about the quality of the resources. You know, it's not enough, it's not enough just to have you know, think of resources as commodities, but really, how do we improve the quality of them? Is that is that a correct observation? Yeah, uh, I think that's very important. Maybe not for all the positions like in a company, but for kind of middle management who has the important role of transforming the stuff, they have to communicate. So at first, they have to understand the technology. Mm -hmm. They also have to understand the kind of picture in the future, where do we want to go to? But then they have to communicate the transformation. And that's the tricky part, because normally you get in a new value chain, uh, you get new customers, you also get maybe new sources where, where you get your stuff from. And to communicate the change from the one value chain to the other, that's a communication task that is not easy. And normally you don't learn that on a technical university, also maybe not an economic university. You're, you're very good in the technical stuff and uh, you, you have a good kind of silo thinking in, in your technology, but you're not able to communicate this positive motivation and positive vibe. And that's even why uh, I mentioned the stoicism because they focus on positive motivation and positive vibes, not, not envy, not aggression and all that stuff, but try to motivate people in their own nature. And uh, when, when you do that, if you just take them on the motivation of their own nature, they will do it by themselves. That's fascinating. And and, and just the, the more we can get people to really have that broad perspective of culture and business and, and you know, go beyond technology and really to bridge all the subjects, the, the better we can pull the ecosystem together. So that's, that's really good. Let me move on to a couple some questions that the people have in our audience. Now, you mentioned at one point you were, you were comparing and contrasting different cities, how some are more innovative and some are less so. They're more political, like, you know, uh, Beijing and Shenzhen, for example, right? It, my, my, my sense is like anywhere we have a political capital, there tends to be a lot of bureaucracy and that tends to really be a drag on things. But anyway, the question here in the chat is, how do you effectively, de effectively deploy innovation framework within a bureaucratic institution? What's the best approach or steps to be taken in a bureaucratic institution? I think it, it's the same that we discussed, try to get people by their positive nature and motivation, uh, because it's it's very important uh, for also for our civil servants. And I, I work a lot with ministries and, and civil servants, and you see them uh, if they do new programs, new frameworks, also new regulation. They have to understand what the, the competitive advantage is also for their region. And when they see they have an impact of their own work, they will be positively motivated. They, they will have fun in their work. And uh, it's also it's, it's very important for the administration to, to get that motivation and fun, like, like all the other innovation guys do in a company or in an agency. So th this is not easy because normally the, the complacency is good as well. 
you know, the, there is a quite safe framework. What we have seen now in the pandemic that uh, like jobs in, in administration were much safer, um, more or less risk than, than in a company that had to, to shuffle up maybe doing new value chains. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even uh, the, the situation we have uh, with the war in Ukraine now, it's the same thing because you have those different sources, different value chain, you have to change maybe your energy system. Uh, and all the thing can also have a positive vibe also in administration. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, so it sounds yeah, uh, it's that still we see that uh, the administrative jobs uh, cost innovation energy, yes. but that's normal. That's normal because in a certain region, in a smaller region like a capital region, you have a better offer for administrative jobs than you have in other regions where you have more pressure to do innovation to get to a company. Yeah, but but that's normal and that's everywhere in the world. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, a, a um, um, big part of this is is really uh, getting getting the leaders in these bureaucratic organizations to really see the vision, a big vision, a larger vision, if you will, uh, of, of where we want to go in our region and take that. If they can see that vision and own it, I think that will overcome a lot of those barriers, like you were saying. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And, and related to that, uh, um one of our guests, one of our audience uh, asked the question, you've mentioned middle management is concerned about maintaining cash flow from current products. What strategies are effective for breaking through to them to garner support, or do we have to go to senior leadership to be able to move forward? So, so can we get it to the middle management? Yeah, it's always top down, uh, which okay. means um, cultural change starts at the top of every organization. Um, you can't start it in middle management, you can't start it in an innovation department that is on the fifth line. Uh, it, it's always the, the top management, it's the CEO, it's the president of uh, the university, whatever organization that is. Mm -hmm. And then it goes down, so the leadership has to be imprinted, and you have to seek the, the motivation for the middle management down there. Because normally they earn the bonuses with the existing products. So. Mm -hmm. If you try to change that, so you integrate them into the risk and also into the success of a new product, then they will be motivated to do that. If okay. they don't see the, their own advantage, their own benefit of this new product or new service, they will never change. So they, they, they have no motivation to do that. You can put in energy as much as you want, there will be no transformation. So therefore, cultural top-down leadership imprinting, and then find the motivational aspects of, of a new service, of a new yeah. product. So really, if, if I wanted to cultivate this success with innovation in my region, I really need to start with the leadership of all of the, the, the stakeholders in the ecosystem, you know, all the, of the different resources. I need to really get the cultural change going on in all of these different uh, organizations starting at the top and, and pushing down. So again, it's just so many things that need to happen in harmony with each other, right? These, these leaders have to set the culture inside the different constituents of the ecosystem, and then they have to come together and work together. So that's very insightful. Um, in, in a, maybe in a, in a, in a nutshell, uh, it's quite easy to judge uh, the situation of innovation ecosystem as well, because if you talk to the top level of the five biggest organizations in the region, you have a very good idea about what the culture is and what the transformation and energy could be. So it, it makes the judgment quite easy. Uh, yeah. I, I know that this is uh, uh, very shortcutted and uh, really in a nutshell, but but you you get the first idea. And I think you're right. For someone like yourself who is an outsider to go talk to these leaders, you can judge that. The, the problem is most of these leaders are myopic and they can't see beyond their own you know little world so as you said a lot of people think we're running we still haven't even warmed up yet they think you know we're very innovative when in fact compared to the best in the world they're not so much so um but yeah i, I think someone you know with your experience could certainly be able to assess that very well let me shift gears a little bit uh our community in africa asked if um uh you throw more light on the frugal innovation how to apply it in an ecosystem like nigeria how does that play a role? In Nigeria, uh, I think Nigeria has uh, one of the best uh, systems uh, of, of innovation. 
but it's uh, more and um, kind of uh, encapsulated it's a, a inner system so it's it's not easy to exchange with the outer world right now because the the political situation and also the the impression of people who should go there uh, what risk they take uh, i think it's uh, not open enough now to really have a good exchange so which means I think Africa has several very successful, very interesting uh, innovation ecosystems, but just some of them are in a geographical surrounding that is easy to access. Which, Someone else, I'll go ahead and finish. Yeah, which means if, if we do kind of innovation trainings in Africa, we try to focus on regions that have a balance between uh, being a good example for innovation there, like frugal innovation, and also accessible, like uh, Cape Town, Nairobi. So where also people go and they, because our media impression of these countries sometimes is very negative. <laughs> that's not always reality. That's just right. media, but that's how right. people perceive it. That, that's how it is. And, and someone in, 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 asked a similar question. What is the African ecosystem's capacity to compete with other ecosystems like in China? How can that imbalance be addressed? It's a it's a matter of future. So they they have the easy way. So like China in the last twenty years, they had a lot of human resources because. So if you went to Shenzhen as a founder of a new company, you could have uh, two thousand engineers the next day for building up a company. Uh, you you can't do that in kind of um, a region in the U.S. in Europe or wherever because the the people are just not there. They're not available, and. Uh, as the, the system changes in China now a little bit as well, because the availability of, of uh, freshly uh, educated engineers in recently like Shenzhen, Shanghai, but also in inner cities like Chongqing, like Chengdu, it's not that easy than uh, in the years before. You will have to look for other regions where this kind of uh, freedom uh, of development is, is still there. And this is kind of flexibility. Like in, in our resource list, we have the human resources, also with the quality of education, the quality of engineering education. And when you have availability of a large number of well-qualified people, then you can go to India as a smart uh, guy, girl, whatever, uh, put in money and get these engineers and build up very fast and be competitive. That reminds me, one, one country where I've seen a lot of those resources is India. You know, they have lots of engineering schools, turning out lots of engineers. But the interesting thing is a lot of those get employed by Western companies that are operating in India rather than Indian companies. Um, so it's almost like the ecosystem is being depleted uh, in a way, you know, by external resources. Yeah, that, that's right. But also that's kind of development of an innovation ecosystem. Okay. So in, in the beginning, you have a lot of kind of foreign direct investments. Also what we have seen in China the last 20 years, that changes a lot as well yeah. now. Even India has changed a lot the last 10 years. So they, they have very good engineering schools. They have a lot of availability. They they have the, the largest population in the world since some months. So they they surpassed China in that aspect. And uh, that's also the region, uh, the reason why we go to Bangalore uh, in November, because this, this is a region that is really coming up, that is expanding, and you can see the changes of the system very good. Uh, yes, you are completely right. In the, in the last years, there were big Western companies, uh, banks, consultancies, whatever, who employed thousands of people in Bangalore and other countries, uh, other cities like Mumbai or Hyderabad. Uh, to employ it, but they are coming up with their own ecosystem, with their own startups, with their own entrepreneurship. They they like to do their own companies. They mm -hmm. they, they they love to love to build them up, and uh, that's what we will see in the next years. And that's why it's interesting to look at it right now, mm -hmm. because now you can get into this new system. So it's mm -hmm. it's not the incumbents anymore. It's the new startups, but as well uh, in some regions in Europe and US, they have no idea what happens there. Yeah, you're right. In fact, in some of these pockets are happening in places we don't even recognize. Just three weeks ago, I was in Brazil, in Florianopolis, in the state of Santa Catarina, at, at the Startup Summit. And there were 10,000 people at the Startup Summit. And there's just a, a tremendous amount of uh, innovation happening in the ecosystem there in Florianopolis and, and Santa Catarina. And like most people have never even heard of this place, right? So, you know, these, these things are happening where these elements of the ecosystem come together. Um, 
couple more questions. Uh, one of our, our audience members from Europe has asked the question, this is great and insightful presentation, yet also scary for Europe. Can you point to some positive opportunities where Europe might have some advantage? Yeah, I, I would say Europe has still one of the best education systems as uh, basic education. And as, as, as you have seen at the triple helix analysis, uh, knowledge is still the best, I would say, and, and the most basic, even, even uh, compared to the US. I think US has some uh, more excellence in some universities in, um, in uh, like the MIT Stanford system. It's more advanced than some of the European universities. But as a basic system, Europe is very good in creating new ideas. But idea is not an invention. And an invention is not innovation, which means there are steps to do to motivate people who have knowledge in Europe to implement it. And that's a matter of a research system, of university system, of the whole education system to motivate people to implement their knowledge because mm -hmm. others will do and they yeah. will be faster than. So yeah, there's a big potential for Europe. There's uh, yeah. a lot of, and it's not just history, it's also future, but as I mentioned in China, the difference is they do. So yeah. if Europe manage to do, uh, like there is not a think tank, but it's a do tank. <laughs> and if you try to, to change that, uh, yeah. then you're better off. Well, that's a great point because I see a lot of, you know, research institutions that, you know, they, they churn out tremendous amount of research and even patents, but none of, like a vast majority of that never gets commercialized. So to me, a, a good formula I've seen is, where you have a university doing research, then you have a strong technology transfer office that is supporting students to do startups with faculty, and then you have some venture capital financing to help fund that, some risk capital. And, and if you can get these things to start to come together, that really helps those universities now start to commercialize a lot of this technology and the results are there. there. But again, it, it's not the university alone. It's not the venture capitalist. It's not the startup founders. It's, it's the ecosystem working together. To, to really cause that flow. So yeah, Europe has that potential and a lot of places in the United States have that potential, but those things have to come together. Let's do one more last question. Uh, this is a more generic question from our audience. He says, um, the question is, would you briefly contrast traditional business, business management and innovation management? How do the two look different from each other? There's no difference because uh, <laughs> if you don't do innovation, you're not on the market and you're not in the business. Uh, so innovation is an integral part of regular business management. Yeah. Uh, so I, I had a very funny discussion last week uh, that uh, so we have an AI seminar in Vienna as well in November uh, with, a, with, a, with Eddie Noodle from, from Tel Aviv uh, joining us. And uh, there is um, some kind of sales and marketing uh, in there, uh, also in the semantics, in the wording. And the consultant told me, Oh, uh, this is nothing for me because I'm doing consulting in uh, a company strategy and not in sales. And I ask him, uh, why is sales not a part of a company strategy? Uh, what, what do they do? Uh, what do they sell? Or how, how do they earn the money if they don't do sales and marketing? So therefore, I, I would say that there is no difference in kind of business strategy in uh, traditional style, innovation style, because innovation always was the implementation of knowledge to the market. So existing knowledge to new markets or new knowledge to existing markets, whatever, just try to earn money with your knowledge. And uh, mm -hmm. that's innovation. That's what always happened in kind of a traditional business strategy as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, if a business is to endure and continue to be relevant to its markets and resilient to long-term change, then it must innovate. That's as simple as that. And so innovation has to become an element of uh, what it does, you know, I, I think the problem most organizations struggle with is um, all the resources are, are tend to be uh, consumed by our current bread and butter, right? It's it's the things we're making money from today. We tend to focus on it a lot, and it's easy to lose focus on the future and the innovation. So organizations really uh, that are most successful this sort of set up two tracks, you know, like like. A uh, 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 ambidextrous organization, you know, where part of our organization is focused on maximizing the profit from our what we currently do. Part of it's focused on developing our value f transactions for the future through innovation. But you, certainly, they they're all part of the same organization, the same strategy. They have to be a part of how we keep the organization relevant over the years and so forth. Yeah. 
So that kind of brings us to the top of the hour. Uh, Ludovic, do you have any final closing thoughts or comments you want to share with us to wrap it up for us? Yeah, I come back to the to the introduction. So why is it interesting to focus on different cultures, on different innovation cultures? So try to get the fun of it, uh, because if you look into other cultures, it will be motivating, it will be fun. You will learn new tools, you will learn, learn about new people, about how to implement knowledge. And I invite everybody uh, to try to look into other cultures. It will develop um, your own ecosystem, but it will also be a benefit for the global development and the understanding of uh, each other. All right, very good. Thank you. And I would encourage everyone, uh, if, if you're so inclined to pick up a copy of the book, Successful Innovation Systems, that Ludovic and his colleagues uh, put uh, published uh, or authored last year. It was published by Springer. And uh, pick up a copy of that. I think you'll get a lot out of reading it and understanding a lot of the details of these different ecosystems in different cities and how they all contribute to each other. So with that, I really want to thank you, Ludovic, for being our guest and sharing your deep knowledge and expertise and insight with us today. I want to thank all of our audience for being our, uh, our, our guest today with us and for participating in the webinar. And uh, we'll wrap it up right there and wish everyone a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks.